start yet, so come on up. This first song we're going to do is a little older. It's been a while since we've done it. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. But when you get the hang of it, sing along with us. Let's sing together. Look inside the street. sacrifices in every war 
And I try to grasp it all, come to grips with it, stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves. I am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families serving their country. I can't always comprehend it. My heart is not big enough to take it all in. That each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service. What we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier. One sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform. One Marine who answered the call to fight for freedom. One airman who knew the cost and went anyway. One man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many. And the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. Good morning. We here at Col- we here at College Park, oh, excuse me. We here at Pace of Family Church just wanted to take this moment to pause and remember uh, what Memorial Day is really all about. It's about 625,000 Americans killed in the Civil War. The six the 116,000 Americans killed in wor- World War One. The 405,000 Americans killed in World War Two. 36,000 Americans killed in the Korean War, the 58,000 Americans killed in the Afghanistan War, the 4,500 Americans killed in the Iraqi War, and all the Americans killed in the other wars. We want to thank you for your service, thank you for your sacrifice, and thank you for for being willing to die for your country. We salute each and every one of you and your families. You guys come back up. Good morning. Welcome to Payson Family Church. My name is John, and uh, we want to not only welcome you, but we want to uh, welcome the, the people who are watching remotely on, on their home computers or on their iPhones. Uh, we thank you for being a part of this. Uh, Today, uh, we're going to uh, need help in helping uh, 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 Joni move today uh, after service. So if you would like to help out uh, after service ends, go home and change or something or get something uh, quick to eat, and then we'll go over to Joni's house and help her load her truck as she uh, gets ready to move up to Washington. Uh, So if you need to know directions, let Pastor know after service, and he'll let you know. Uh, Saturday morning men's gathering, every 8, 8 a.m., every Saturday. Uh, we have been meeting here at the church, and I guess we'll meet next Saturday here again, right, Tom? Okay, we'll meet next year, next Saturday. So we want to invite you men to be a part of this uh, prayer ministry, this uh, service ministry to this church and, and our community, and uh, we'd like for you to be a part of that. Every Saturday morning, 8 a.m., here at the church. Uh, Father's Day meal and barbecue, yay. Um, Meat, coleslaw, drinks provided, uh, provided, invite a friend. It's a great opportunity to, to invite someone that you may know that doesn't normally come to church and say, hey, we're having a fellowship, we're getting together, and we'll feed you a good barbecue, and just, uh, just to come together. And so invite somebody. Invite somebody you may know. It's, uh, it's a good, uh, good thing to do. Uh, prayer requests, giving, giving guest cards uh, are in the back of the pews, as you can see. Um, uh, if you have a, somebody that you know that needs, is in need of prayer, let us know by filling out a, a prayer card, and we'll make sure it gets to Tom Geiger, and he'll, he'll pray <coughs> over the prayers that, that are received in his uh, Sunday morning prayer uh, uh, fellowship. And that's every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. They get together in the study room in the very back, back here. Come and be a part of that, 
and uh, um, your heart will be blessed. Any of the cards that you fill out today, as you leave today, you'll see there's a treasure chest in the back. Just drop those cards in the treasure chest and your uh, offering envelopes in that treasure chest. We'll make sure it gets to the people who handle that. Wednesday night Bible study and fellowship is every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, it's a time where we can get together and not only fellowship, but we'll enjoy and break bread together and have a meal uh, before we get into the study. And it starts at 6, so come and be a part of that. We want to invite you on that. Birthdays this week, uh, Will Hubbard, somebody's husband over here, anyway, um, is on Saturday, so uh, uh, we'll make sure Will's going to, you, you're going to be here next Sunday, right? You're not going to go out of town. Oh, okay, good. Well, we can congratulate him on his birthday next Sunday at the barbecue, but anyway, uh, we wanted you to be a part of that. Not next Sunday, I'm sorry. So now Will, now Will has two weeks to, to, yeah, he has two to, to get ready for that. Um, but uh, uh, that's going to be the third week of July. We'll, we'll let you know when, as it gets closer. Um, and please prayerfully consider your financial support for this ministry here at Payson Family Church. A lot is going on here. As you can see, uh, I don't know if some of you noticed, but uh, there was a lot of work done around the grounds this week, and uh, God's been good. He's been so good to, to this church, and I know he has a great plan for us here at Payson, Fam- uh, Payson Family Church that he, this, we're going to not only grow, but we're going to make a difference in this community and make a difference in this town where people will come to know the Lord as their Savior. So we want to welcome you to be a part of all these different ministries that we have and uh, just have your heart blessed by being involved. In serving the Lord. Well, let's all stand and greet greet one another. Welcome to Payson Family Church.
We don't start worship. We join in with all of creation and the angels who are constantly singing and praising God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So we just got to sing the same song to our same Lord as the angels sing to him constantly, all the time. And it just was fun. I just, you know, okay, now all I have to do is remember where I'm going with this so I don't mess it up. But... Uh, this uh, Lord that we worship, he also sent a son, Jesus, to redeem us. And uh, the song tells us that there's a reason why certain things happen. And that reason why is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
solar system and we had our little few planets we thought the world was big the universe was big then they launched Hubble telescope and then they discovered a universe over here and a universe over here and so that little cube that we thought was our world has grown exponentially and God is still not a resident of the known world he lives outside of all known universes and he transcends to us And he gives us things we don't deserve. He loves us just the way we are. And he doesn't stop giving on what we can see. Because if we only got what we could see, imagine what we would miss out on when we become his eternally. Jesus, I'm grateful. You take me simply as I am, Jesus, I'm grateful, you take me simply as I am, Jesus, I'm 
Pastor Chris. Good morning, church. I'd like to add to um, John's announcements. Thank you, John, for doing those so passionately. You are in Pace in Arizona. <laughs> but, you know, we, it is God's universal church, big C church, so it doesn't matter if, if, uh, if we misstate where we fellowship. It only matters if we misstate why we fellowship. And John loves fellowship. And if you guys don't know John, um, meet me after. Today, I'll give you his address. Just pop in. Uh, John and Lori are fantastic people, and, and he's part of the reason why I wanted to add this extra announcement. <clears throat> we did work here this week, and John was always here before anybody else got here. And I, to be honest with you, I don't understand that. Um, he is a hard worker. And he's a blessing. And one of the days that we were working, he went and bought us lunch. And it was fried chicken. <laughs> so if uh, you want to get on the pastor's good side. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> Coffee and fried chicken. Um... John, what's that? At this point in my life, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. um, John, thank you. Tom, thank you. Um, I, I'm uh, Jim, thank you. Uh, Frank, thank you. Isaac, thanks for help. Did I say that already? Like driving home from, from being here, I just thank you. Did I tell you that already? He's like, yeah, thanks. Uh, Cliff, thank you. Uh, who am I missing? Robert, you have Robert Aguirre. Uh, Bill, Greg, all the way from Pine comes Greg to help. So, thank you to all of you. Uh, a lot of work got done. And, uh, yeah, huge. Just And the fellowship was fantastic. It's nothing like yelling at each other over the sound of a mini excavator and chainsaws. <laughs> well, that sounded bad. We weren't yelling at each other with chainsaws. Um, just communicating was loud. You just got that, didn't you? I love you guys. I'm so happy that you're here today. I know it's a holiday, and we're missing part of our fellowship family, and, and I understand that. That's People travel, and if you didn't know that, go south today on the B-Line. And then if it doesn't make enough impact, go south tomorrow afternoon on the B-Line. Uh, anybody notice how dry it is out? I am shocked by how much static there is. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. First Peter's. First Peter's follow up. Second Peter. We're in this First Peter, Second Peter series. Just the epistles of Peter, who wrote in the the first century, started these writings about thirty years after Jesus ascended, talking to the early church, giving them comfort, giving them uh, understanding. The world's in chaos, but God is in control. Remember to live this way, remember to live this way, remember to live this way. 
And, and today, as we start his second epistle, it is, he's taken a direction, bless you, he's taken a direction of overall, really, trust in God's provision. How often do we thank God for the little things? Well, what a weird question. Is there really any little thing? The fact that our feet hit the floor this morning, that's a miracle. It's God's grace. The fact that you took a breath after I said what I just said is God's grace. I'm not saying that we take it for granted. I just think we miss the miracle in life. God has provided. So as we talk today, remembering that it's the basic truths of God that can get us through anything. When Peter wrote, it was to a congregation of scattered people. They were, if you remember the story, there was trouble, there was persecution, there was scattering, there was hiding, there was fear, there was government rule, there was government chaos, there was lack of of their ability to worship truly as freely as, as they wanted to. They weren't sure how they'd be accepted. Some of them gave up everything to follow Christ. I just really think that right now in in second half of 2020 and now into 2021, we are so similar to the first century church and that God is sifting and, and giving an opportunity for you and I to say, I'm all in or I'm not interested because times are are I don't want to say scary because I'm not I I fear no man uh, not because I'm bold and strong or that I can even lift my arms over my head anymore I fear no man because it's God alone that I fear and what is the worst thing that can happen to a Christian somebody puts you in the presence of God what's there to fear But in this chaos, I see so much of what Peter was saying. So let's hear the next epistle here. First, or excuse me, Second Peter, first chapter, verses one to four. Simon Peter, a servant of the apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, Normal opening. Hey, I'm the author of this. This is who I am, and then who it's to, who it's from, who it's to, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. <clears throat> Years ago when I was in student ministries, this, this particular verse, 2 Peter 1, 3, that was our phrase, that was our verse for the ministry. And it wasn't because we got the leadership together and, and formed a committee and said, everybody give me your favorite verse, and we're going to pick one for the ministry, it was really because I felt led that this is what junior hires need to know. If, if you don't remember junior high, that's when the world seemed impossible for the first time. <laughs> Happens again in college because you realize, oh, I may not even have a direction in life, but here's where I'm going. God, I hope this is in, in your will. But junior high is when your school changes, your body changes, your friends change, your goals change, your curfew changes, what, how much TV you're allowed to watch changes, and then you wake up the next day and it changes. And to me, I thought, you know what junior hires need to know is they don't need to worry about anything in their own power. What they need to to do is to know and have a relationship with a God who has given them everything they need to live life eternal and godliness living here. It's a great verse. So we 
designed a shirt. I had a, I had a relationship with a guy down in the valley who did all kinds of colleges and sports teams t-shirts. We got a good ministry deal on them. And uh, we had an emblem, live wire on the front, and on the back was this verse. We get the shirts printed, maybe in order of 300. We had, I don't know, 75 to 80 junior hires on a Wednesday, so we start handing these out. I want you to wear these to camp, or whatever. And we're advertising them in the Ramada. This is when I was down the street at Mountain Bible. And a very loving individual came up to me and he said, uh, man, I really like your shirts. I said, thank you. It's an older gentleman. He said, but you misspelled divine. And my first thought was, no, I didn't. I didn't proofread it, but I wrote it down and I sent it off and surely the t-shirt guy would have proofread it. Picked up a shirt and I spelled divine, D-E-V-I-N-E. That was partly my thought. What did I do to a scripture that says God has given everything you need except for I didn't use the fact that he gave me everything I needed to just look at how to spell divine? 300 t-shirts. So I'm panicked. What do we do? call this guy up down in the valley and said, you know, we'll be, we got a problem here. He says, what did I do wrong? I said, nothing. I didn't proofread it. I sent it off. I typed it out, sent it off. The shirt looks great. I misspelled something. He said, box them up and bring them to me. I went down and saw him, and he ended up taking those 300 shirts, screen printing those 300 shirts, and they were already three color. And he puts 300 onto, onto the sleeves and starts just printing. He prints a little white box over the word divine 300 they dry put some backs on and prints it again in like fluorescent blue as if to point out this is the word that this youth pastor wants to emphasize so we're printing it this way in this box divine well i didn't admit it to anybody until here so thank you for the counseling (laughs) he didn't charge us Uh, anything. The only thing that has to do with today's sermon is that if I would have looked at what I knew was in here, he provided the proper spelling. And it is, when I say God takes care of the little things, he did. He not only took care of the shirts getting better, they're t-shirts. What kind of ministry value is that? There was a little. They were witnessing tool, but it took me back into a point in my ministry years of saying, I will pay better attention to his word. In all of that, I have this growth, first of all, of humility and growth of it's okay to make a mistake and growth of go back to God's word always. Such a simple thing. But God gave that all to us in his word. He gave us everything. Years and years back, the chief of the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, excuse me, Blackfoot Confederacy Confederacy tribe in uh, southern Alberta, up in Canada. So the chief of this tribe in Canada was asked by the railroad, we need to go through your land. He granted access to the railroad to go through the land, and then the railroad system then gave him this pass. Here's a piece of paper that for your lifetime, you can ride the railroad anywhere you want, go any, anytime you want, as many times as you want. Like the e-ticket at, at, at Disneyland, here is this for you. You did us a favor, we do you a favor. Well, he was proud. He wore that. He made this deal with an organization. He was a a very good friend with a very powerful, back in those days, the railroad was a very powerful organization. And he put it in a leather pouch and he carried it. It didn't have a plastic like 
see-through or anything on it to show it, but he wore it in this leather pouch around him. And as the story goes, his entire life, he carried that with him everywhere he went. But he never rode the railroad. And that seems like kind of a, a, a silly statement, but how different are we sometimes as Christians? We have everything that we need for life and godliness and we'll wear the Christian t-shirt with the new spelling of divine on it. We'll wear the cross. We'll put a poster on the wall. Not just the cap that says when, when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot, hang on. You know, so cute. But the poster that says I can do all things through Christ, which so many times is misused. But we do this Christianity marketing with ourselves but we don't ever truly take advantage of the fullness of what God has given us. We carry it with our entire lives. We have the ability for it. This, it wasn't printed before I was born, but it was written and established before I was born. It's been around a long time, yet I didn't go back to it just to see the spelling of a word. How often in our Christian lives do we not partake in the deepest gifting that God has given us as human beings now that are loved and saved by his son, how often do we do things on our own instead of counting on God's promises? It, it, it comes to a point sometimes of being a tragedy, honestly, and I know I'm, I'm bringing up probably too much, but if I would have just been stronger in God's word, I wouldn't have misspelled divine. And in our text this morning, Peter wants us to know something. He wants us to know that there is far more to being a child of God than just Sunday morning service and nighttime prayers. That's typically what people think of as Christians. You're a Christian? Oh yeah, I am. And our first question to somebody is, where do you go to church or where do you fellowship? And I have some problems with that. When people say, I go to so-and-so's church, I really have an issue with that because if it is God's church, it's God's church, bottom line. But our first question to Christians, where do you fellowship? Because that's what's interesting to us. Could you imagine if we walked around as Christians and finding out someone's a Christian and the first word is, what did God do for you today? What part of God's full provision today did you use to make it through life? Can you imagine the blank stare you'd get from somebody? Matter of fact, I'm going to give you an opening sermon challenge. That's your challenge. The next time that, that uh, someone says, hey, I'm a Christian, I want you to say, say those words or ask that question. That's awesome. What part of God's full provision through his divine nature for life and godliness have you partaken in today? Because that's what, pe yeah. And people be like, no, I'm a Christian. It is a lot of words. There's just a fullness to our existence, I think, as Christians that we haven't tapped into. And I'm not saying this, we need to, to sit or we need to chant or we need to do, we don't know, we don't need to go deeper in ourselves to have more of Him. We have been given all of Him. My question is, are we living in the fullness of what's already been provided? This Christian life is not open to our varying human interpretation. It's not. We don't get to say, well, this is what I think Christian life is, and it be accurate, unless it's exactly what God says, this is what Christian life is. But if we were to get in here and look accurately at what it is, we would see the fullness of, wow, I'm missing out. And I'm not missing out because God withheld. I'm missing out because I've withheld Him in my life. There is a fullness of our existence in God that we have to pursue and exemplify it's a fullness that we've been called to, and, and we're taking so long to get there if we ever get there. And Peter is saying to these first century saints, he's saying, look, you've got struggles, you've got troubles, you don't know who to trust, you don't know if you'll live today, you don't know if your family will abandon you, but everything that you do, you need to do under the power of everything God has provided for you for life and godliness. Breaking it down, here's what Peter is telling his first century believers. Um, hit that slide for me, will you? Speak for me. 
We must live out the new life that God has provided for us and not the old life we've just altered for God. And here's what I mean by that. That so many times Christians will be, I'm going to make this change, I'm going to make this change, I'm going to make this change, and I'm going to do this for God. But God said, wait a minute, I already did everything for you. Why don't you let me make this change and let me make this change and let me make this change? Because he hasn't called us to alter our life for him. He has called us to live the life he has for us already. If this isn't separated, I'm afraid that there are going to be some people that will stand before Jesus and Jesus will say, I never knew you. That it's as serious not just to be living this life that he's given us, but it's as serious as are we truly in the relationship that we think we're in with him. Because if you alter your life to become a Christian, you haven't accepted the life that was given for you to become a Christian. And what Peter is saying is measure yourself carefully. Live out the life God has called you to. He's given you new life. He's given you meaning. He set your value. Stop just living your old life a little bit altered for him because that's not a relationship. That's what we're going to look at today. Let's, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. complete grace that is complete provision from every breath to step to ability to movement to acquirement to accomplishment God everything that we go through that is good is only because you've allowed it for us by your grace today let our hearts be open to hearing more from you that will never be satisfied that our thirst will be quenched but we will thirst again for the same quenching God that you will be the permanent provision that we seek God ask that you would be with those that are hurting we have a couple people here in our fellowship in particular that need physical healing God, I ask that you would reach into their innermost being, touch their lives, heal their bodies. Miraculously, through, through treatment, through doctors, through medicine, however you choose to do it, God, we ask that it would be your will that miracles would happen in the lives of those who are physically and emotionally and spiritually hurting right now. God, thank you that your provision is enough. Let that soak into our, mar- into our minds and our hearts today. We love you. God, as always, I ask that you would speak through me in spite of me. In Jesus' name, amen. In this life, it's, it's not God's way or the highway. And now you're thinking, well, it probably is. But think about it this way. It's really just God's way. There is no alternative. We're born in the alternative. If you want to change, then it becomes, it's God's way. For you and I to grasp that simplicity, we need to understand this is His world. One of my favorite statements to those people who think that God should be doing what I want, God should be doing this, if he's a loving God, if he truly cares for me, and we throw this statement in, this is how he should be acting, or I'm mad at God, or I don't want to go to church because God did this, God let this, God should have done this, God missed this. One of my favorite statements comes from Francis Chan. Go ahead, Jesse. God is the only being who is good. And the standards are set by him. Because God hates sin, he has to punish those guilty of sin. Maybe that's not an appealing standard, but to put it bluntly, when you get your own universe, you can make your own standards. (laughs) Francis Chan. I have, I, I wouldn't call it a man crush, I would call it a ministry crush on that guy. He is, God has transformed him and he is passionate for reality to come into Christians' lives, the reality of God's truth. 
it's a very bold statement, but the good news is this. With God's expectation for you and I to live the life he's given us for him, in the instruction and in the command to live this way comes the power to follow through on it. And if you and I were to understand this concept, it is God's way. It is God's universe. It is God's existence that we are living and breathing in. It's because he's allowed it, and this is what he's called us to do. And then for some people, they think, well, that's too hard. I can't do it. Let me remind you, you're right. You can't. I can't. But God isn't one of those people. (laughs) I'm not going to look at any. Well, you know, I'm going to look at people right now because it's rude to look up. But I'm not insinuating this is anybody in the room. Well, you know, there's some people that like to bring more problems than solutions into your life. Don't start thinking, do not nudge someone next to you. God's not one of those people. God brings a command with the power to follow through. Truly, God is the most positive person you would ever know. Because everything from him is for your and mine, yours and mine, good. Sorry, teachers. I messed that up. I, you know what? I, I'm a licensed pastor, and with that comes invention of word. God has granted us everything we need for life and godliness through knowing Christ and trusting in his all-sufficient promises. Peter puts it plainly, and you're going to hear this for the next 32 minutes. I think it's a good statement. You would think that people would be happy about it, but believe it or not, some Christians don't like the fact that they should be relying on God more than themselves. Back in 1991, John MacArthur published a book. It's called Our Sufficiency in Christ, and the book is about our sufficiency in Christ. It's not a hidden story. It is truly what it's about. John MacArthur felt... If I talk about God being all-sufficient, some people are going to push back and say, yeah, but what about this? What about that? It happened. And it happened when he talked to people. And as a matter of fact, he wrote on page 19 that something about the sufficiency in the Christian church would be pushed back on, that people would need to rely on things more than God. And here's what he said, page 19. He says, too many Christians have tacitly acquiesced. Great words to the notion that our riches in Christ, including Scripture, prayer, and the indwelling of the Spirit, and all the other spiritual resources we find in Christ, simply are not adequate to most people's real needs. John MacArthur is a a little bit on the Calvinist side of life, and and that's fine. We're all going to get to heaven, by the way, and find out we were wrong on a lot of things. But if you're in heaven, you were right about the right things, so that's really what matters. So John MacArthur says this, that too many people in the current church have just given in and given permission to the thought process that if you take everything that you know about God, all the resources, the Holy Spirit that lives in us, the prayer, the the benefit that we have of being a Christian, the privilege to talk to Him, the Scripture that we have, where if we read it more, we'll even know how things are spelled. All of that, some Christians say it's not enough. I need more. It's kind of a shocking thought. Most of you, I, I hope all of you are thinking, well, that's, that's not me, and that's good. John MacArthur goes on to say that many evangelical churches and seminaries put more of an emphasis on what man's limited education and knowledge can do than what God's full provision has done. And I'm going to say that in a little different bit of a story. The one, my dad was a pastor. And the only one argument that I had with him about Scripture had to do with what he learned in seminary and what God showed me in his word. And it had to do with the Scripture that says that a man will die once and then be judged. That's what it's appointed. God planned this life that a man will die once and then be judged. Now, my dad and I both agreed on the fact that we get one life here. There's no reincarnation. We got past that. But the die once 
What's the difference between he and I? And to him, the die once was, you die to the flesh and you accept Jesus Christ, which is a proper thing to do. And to me, die once was, I traced that word throughout Scripture, cross-references, and it meant dead, D-E-A-D, not physically alive. So we argued back and forth, and then finally it came to this. I said, Dad, why do you feel that way? And he said, because my seminary teacher taught me that. Now, I'm not against seminaries, although usually they're skewed to the president of the seminary's idea of what Scripture says. And I went to Bible college and not to seminary. And like I said, we're all going to get to heaven and realize we were wrong about a lot of things. But here's something we all need to be right about. We need to never let any church, any pastor, any Bible study, any book that we, that we want to put with the Bible, please don't ever replace the Bible with anything man wrote. We, we cannot ever believe that... It's more important for us to have acquisitions and abilities to count on in times of crisis than to just turn to the one who created us and trust him to take care of us. To support this point of the struggles, he says, John MacArthur says, listen to any call-in show on a Christian radio or or visit a Christian bookstore and note the proliferation of so-called Christian, I'm going to do this, Christian recovery books. The counsel dispensed through these means may have a few biblical references scattered throughout, but it doesn't encourage Christians to avail themselves to the riches in Christ. And if you're not following me on that, what what he is saying is there are so many self-help and there's nothing wrong with helping self. But if you don't turn to the one who created self to fix self, it's like taking your, your broken computer to the shoe manufacturer. Hey, I know you do this on the side, but why would you not go to the one who created you to help you? And that's what John MacArthur is saying, that that it's so important to rely on God first and foremost. And there are, well, let me continue because I'm going to go off on a tangent and it's not going to help anything. It's this false message that more often than not is declared that simply pointing Christians to their spiritual sufficiency in Christ is not going to be good enough for their well-being. That they need Christ plus this. Or yes, Jesus loves you and, and God's on the throne. I'm not real, real, real big on that because it was never in question to me. But it's this feel good. But then read this book and here's this many steps to happiness and this many steps to putting up with your own sin and this many steps to falling in love with yourself. Plainly stated, we must all be very careful that we don't ever believe that God alone isn't sufficient. Now, to clarify, I am not, I never have been and I never will be against proper counseling. I am not against that at all. It's in Scripture. I encourage mature godly Christians to offer biblical counsel to less mature believers. I'm not against the science of psychology. I'm not against understanding how man is wired to think and act. As a matter of fact, when you understand more about yourself, you'll understand uh, more about truly how you were created to be and how God wants you back on track with that. I'm also not against medication in some cases. And I really struggle with people that are that say, God has to be enough for you. Well, God is enough for you, but you know what? God created doctors and he allowed it to become science and he allowed that to become chemistry and he allowed that to become medicine and pharmacy. And, and fast description because I'm way off track here. Don't look at your watches. John has diabetes. His body doesn't produce insulin if I understand that disease properly. It's not balanced insulin. So he would take medicine to help an organ in his body work better, Right? And there are some people that struggle emotionally, and I'm not against taking something that helps the organ work better. And what I don't want this morning is controversy of you don't believe in psychology, and you don't believe in in this, and you don't believe in that. Here's what I don't believe in. I don't believe in the world before God, ever. I don't believe in science before God. I don't believe in medicine before God. I, 
I believe in God and God alone is where we start. And then what has he provided for us to continue? Okay? So I'm not one of those people that is going to tell you your, your foot hurts because you're in sin. And you just need to fix your life and be right with God. Well, maybe you need to stop wearing flip-flops and going for a hike. That's why your foot hurts. My problem is not with Christians giving or getting counsel. My problem is with Christians giving or getting non-biblical counsel. And, and for example, I've been told by, by people throughout my ministry career that they have gone to see a counselor, a Christian counselor, and it didn't do any good, so they don't want to talk to anybody anymore. But then I would ask them, okay, well, did they pray with you? No. Well, did they open the Bible and look through Scripture with you? No. Well, did they try to address what God has for you against what, what you're trying to do for yourself and what the Bible says that we need to die to the flesh or and live in the Spirit, whatever it is? And they said no. And then I would tell them, you didn't go to Christian counseling. I'm not against something that God has allowed us to have that's based on Him to begin with. What I'm against and what Peter is saying right here is that God has given us everything. First and foremost, we rely on everything that he's provided. We ride the railroad because he's given us the ability to ride it. That makes sense. To me, the best Christian counsel starts off with what we're talking about this morning. God's our sufficiency. It moves from there where it needs to go, but it stays on track with that. All healing starts with knowing that God has granted us everything we need for life and for godliness. It's in Scripture, and you either believe the Bible or you don't. And if you do, you believe everything in it. But I want to make sure that you catch the wording in our reading, that God has granted us all things for life and godliness. God has not granted us all things for our peace and for our tranquility. Pastor, but I'm just not sitting at rest right now. Didn't God provide all that? No, God provided all things for life and godliness. And if you're not at peace and if you're not at rest, maybe you're not seeking him. Those things come along with it, but he didn't put us in a world that produces that. Again, drive south on the beeline this afternoon and tomorrow. God did not grant all things for our comfort and for our self-esteem. God did not grant all things for our finances and our popularity. God did not grant all things for our pride and for our own self-sufficiency. Why would God try to make you reliant on yourself? And definitely, God did not grant all things for our independence and for our self-worship. If you've read Scripture, you'll know that there isn't any Scripture that says we must seek to have a trouble-free life. If I knew King James did, there is no thou shall seeketh thine own perfecto life. It's not in there. Yes, I'm old enough to know King James. Here's what Scripture says. Regardless of the troubles in your life, live freely in God's will. Not comfortably, not happily, freely in God's will. And we can do that because he's already given us everything we need to live in his will. So here's our text this morning. Makes clear this main point. Go ahead, Jesse. That the gift of Jesus Christ is God's full provision for us. Well, pastor, what are you saying? I'm telling you that Jesus is everything we need. And God gave us Jesus. He didn't just happen in on the scene. And this point cannot be overstated. If we are wanting to live freely in God's will... The Christian does not need anything in addition to what God has provided for us to live in his will. It's all been given. We just have to understand what we have. We just have to understand how do I apply it. And if you don't get this, either Jesus and his ways are sufficient for our every need or the Bible is untrue. Because that's the all of Scripture, that Jesus did what we couldn't do for ourselves so that we could be what God originally wanted us to be, and that's with Him. Again, I hope this message doesn't get controversial to you. I hope that you just understand and see how precious God's provision is. And it all starts with this. God has fully provided us what we need for living with Him. Now, this is the first part of the statement in the Scripture Peter's proclamation of life in this statement refers to the eternal life that we receive through Christ. 
If you didn't know this, God did not create eternity. Give that some thought. If eternity was created, it couldn't be eternity. Just like God, eternity always has been. God didn't change the requirements of dwelling with him for eternity. It's still based on our righteousness. That hasn't changed. So what always has been still is being and will always be. But what God did do to take care of the sin problem is give us Jesus Christ. He gave a full provision for what he wanted for us, and that's for us to have the ability to return to him. And Jesus alone is the way back into righteousness that God requires for our fellowship with him. He didn't change us in the way we act. He changed us by who we now serve, and it's been appointed to us the righteousness of Christ that because of his actions, we benefit. So he didn't lower the bar. He didn't invent something or find a place for us to go. What he did is stay on track because that's what eternal things are, is on track all the time. And then he introduces to us, hey, I want these people to have life. He gives us Jesus Christ. That provision, by the way, is what has been most important to God and has been his focus since sin in the garden. God has been pursuing reconciliation with man since the sin in the garden. Am I saying that God has been chasing you, wanting you to stop and accept his son? Yes. If you haven't done it, yes. If you have done it, that's how it happened. God pursued you. That's the provision that is most important to God and has been his focus since It needed to change from dwelling in our presence to allowing us back to dwell in His presence. So back before we took our first breath, way before we could ever think about how are you going to make it through this crazy life on earth. Have you ever thought that? Woke up in the day and think, how am I going to make it through this day? i got to go to the church and these guys are crazy. They're working hard and there's dust flying and I'm coughing up mud and the saws are loud and machinery's running and I told them I'd be there and I really this morning my body's reminded me that one more day is going to remind me again. How am I going to make it through this day? You're the only one smiling. Before we tried to figure out how can I make it through this God made a way for us to live with him for eternity. Kind of gives you his focus, doesn't it? God cares more for our eternal life than our temporary one. Oh, pastor, come on. Are you saying that he would rather me be with him than me have riches? Yeah. Are you saying that he would rather me be with him than me be happy and comfortable all day long? Yes. Think about this. Before God guides us to any kind of successful living here, he wants us to first acquire a successful dying. That's odd, isn't it? Get into Genesis and you will find out that God's love and grace in action was allowing us to die so that we have a way to be with him without sin. Some of you are thinking, I don't understand that. I want you to read chapter 3 and 4 of Genesis and then come back and talk to me about it. Ask yourself this. What about our now would even matter if our then wasn't worth living for? If you had nothing to live for, to look forward to, to be locked into, what about now would matter? You could do whatever you wanted You can momentarily make your your flesh happy because it doesn't matter because there was no then. And what God said is, I want the eternal to matter to you more than the temporary. And he provided life. I'm going to give them the eternal. So Peter spells it out. He says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life. You and I are naturally dead in our sins when we're born. We don't need helpful hints for easy living. We don't need five steps to happier existence. I said this before. We don't need guidelines to hide or tolerate our sinfulness. What we need, you and I, the very first thing that we need when we become accountable for our actions and we understand it, we need life. And God gave us everything we needed for life. And it came in the person of Jesus Christ. God implants new life, eternal life. It's a free gift. And if you do not possess eternal life in Jesus, then nothing else I'm going to tell you this morning matters. 
So if you're not asleep already, you can just go to sleep now if you're not saved because it's not going to matter to you. But I will notice that you're asleep, and we're going to pray over you when this is over, and we're going to introduce you to Jesus. So if you're sleeping right now, you get Jesus. Don't wake him up. Don't wake him up. It's all right. The Apostle John said it clearly. Look at this scripture. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. This is the truth that is blared out from our mouths that God gave us eternal life. God gave us life. God said, you messed it up. You ruined it. You decided you wanted your happiness over obedience to me. And his response was this. I'm going to give you life. What a loving, gracious God. It's not go put your nose on the wall eternally. It's not, uh, you know, this many spankings from God. It's, it's not the ultimate denozo, for those of you that watched that show. It is life, and God says, here's life, and whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So make sure you've received Christ. Life, that's what he wants to give us. Now, it's not just something that pertains to heaven, life, but that's where God started. But it's first and foremost, He gave us life through Jesus Christ. But next, God has provided fully for everything that we need for living in Him. Jesse, thank you. In Him. So we go from living with Him, and now we're secure. And now He's given us everything to live in Him. The expression in Christ, in the Lord, or in Him occurs 164 times in the letters of Paul alone. Do you think it's important that we understand that we are in Christ? So Paul, almost half of the New Testament attributed to his writing, 164 times referred to being in Christ. Those in Christ have an inner serenity which adversity cannot disturb. It's, it's peace. Because I'm in Christ, I now have peace. He gave me life, and now this is going to be the more abundant. To, to mix a couple of scriptures together, he gave me life, and now here's the more abundant, and now I'm in him. People that are in Christ have a spiritual power that physical weakness cannot destroy. It's the power of being in Christ. They have a hidden vitality that even the process of dying and death cannot quench. Too many Christians are trying to claim eternal life through Christ but not live their life in Christ, and it can't happen. I'm telling you, it can't happen. In, in John 15, 4-5, Jesus says it like this, Abide in me and I in you. He's setting the stage. We have a relationship, and it's me and you together. You abide in me, and I'll abide in you. Now you're in me. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. If you want to live your life, it's got to be in me. He says, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And then here's this shot from Jesus. He says this, because apart from me, you can do nothing. You want to succeed in your life? You won't do it. You want to live a life boldly for me? You won't do it. If you want to be uh, living in, in, in joy and serenity, you won't do it unless you're in me. Quit relying on things outside of me to bring you things that you think you need. And by the way, when you're living in Christ, the things you think you need seem to change. To be in Christ is where the power of the eternal God is manifest in the life of his children. When we are in Christ, it's where the rubber meets the road. To be in Christ is to be constantly in His Word. Jesse, for thousands of years, the Bible has been adequate to equip the saints to go through unspeakable tragedy. For thousands of years, understanding the teaching of Jesus Christ has been what people rely on. Our problem today is that people don't think the Bible's enough. Now, this is where I may especially young people, I may offend a little bit, and and I don't mean to, but I'm okay with doing it. If you add anything to this, don't waste your time with this. If you add, now, if you read this 
And then you read something else that helps you understand that. That's not what I'm talking about. If you read this and then you read something else that, that helps break this down, if you exegese through another, uh, somebody else's writing, I read commentaries. But what I'm talking about is you think, oh, I read the Bible, but I also read this book over here that helps me understand that I'm a better person than I thought I was. And if I do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that if it, doesn't come back to, if it doesn't refer back to, if it didn't come out of this in the first place, stay away from it because you're running away from this. God has fully provided what we need for living in here. To be in Christ is to be constantly in his word. To be in Christ is to have all of Christ at our disposal. To be dwelling with him through prayer, meditation, on his word, and you're either all in or you're all out. There is no middle ground on this. Remember what Jesus said? Book of Revelation, he's talking to John the Baptist, and, and John is taken up into the Spirit. It's the second time in Scripture that we see this. And Jesus says, hey, write these things down. And, and he's there in Revelation 3, and he's like, write this to the churches. And in reference to the lukewarm Christianity of the church of Laodicea, here's what Jesus says. He says, behold, I stand at the door. This is to a church. Now put this personally if you want to, but this is to a church that is leading people that it's okay to just have one foot in the water. And Jesus is basically saying your one foot in the water is a waste of time. You're either all in or you're all out. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him. I will live life with him and he with me. For those of you who think that I don't want Jesus taking control, do you understand that it's the best thing you can do is allow him to have control? Because now you're in him. And if you are in the creator of the universe, if you are in his will, or you're living the life that he has for you, where else would you want to be? But this church wanted to also be in the flesh. So Jesus continues, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. If you want to be And when I use the word successful, I don't use it in the world's ways. Christian success is through obedience, not through end result, by the way. For those of you that think I did all of this and this still didn't happen, if God told you you do this and you did it, you're successful in God's eyes. Obedience is success for a Christian. Living in Christ is what's going to separate the Christians who play church from the Christians who truly are the church. And I know it's cliche. We need to stop playing church. We need to start being the church. But here's what Jesus said to him. Remember, he said, that you're, not, you're not cold and you're not hot. You're putting one foot in where it requires your entire body, and you make me sick. I'll spit you out of my mouth. References to waters and different bodies of waters that come through and where they mix together. You had cold water with life in it and hot water that brought healing, and then they mixed together and everything kind of died. And that's really what this is, that if you bring the world and you bring what God has and you try to mix them together so you can live a fulfilled life, you're dead. There's no life in you. If you are in Christ, it's both feet. It's the whole body jumped in. God has provided the way to be in a full relationship with him through Christ, have you allowed that relationship to happen? Once we realize that power that we have now living in him, then the last thing we need to know is this. God has fully provided um, what we need for living for him. And that takes us from life through life in him to now godliness. He's given us everything. Peter not only says God has given us everything pertaining to eternal life, now he's given us everything to live the life that he's called us to live here, physical living. Godliness is inextricably bound up with eternal life. And what I mean by that is that if you are saved, if you are born again, you will be sanctified. And it's a daily growth and and cutting off of the scales and dying to the sin and bringing on the works of the Spirit and living in the Spirit, it is a daily growth of now living in godliness. And if you're not growing in godliness, you may not have a relationship with a God who wants to grow you there. And I don't say that to challenge anybody's salvation. That's a hard issue between you and God. But there will be times, I referenced earlier, there will be a, a time when, when, when Jesus says to, to people, depart from me, I never knew you. Do not play church. Do not play Christian. God's given us everything that we need to live in Him. Accept all of that and live in Him. God has fully provided for us what we need to live for Him. Now, 
We're never going to attain perfection in this life. We should see growth, though, especially in these two commandments, love God more and love people more every day. That should be growing. But Peter shows us this. Go ahead, Jesse. That God has has enacted his divine power for our benefit. God did not do what he's doing just so he can sit back and say, look what I did. God did what he did for us to be able to be a part of what he's called us to do. You and I get all the benefit. Jesus did all the work. God is in control and receives all the glory. It's, It's perfection at perfection's best. In other words... It's not about our techniques. It's not about reading a book. It's not about following this procedure and and we're going to be uh, living right for God. God says, there's nothing you can do on your own to live right for me, so I'm going to give you everything you need to live right for me. The Holy Spirit's part of our life at the moment of salvation. We have God's Word. We have our prayer time. We hear His voice, some audibly, some spiritually. God has given us everything we need to live for Him. Remember that header, we must not live out the new life that God has provided for us. Um, Excuse me, we must live out the new life God has provided for us, not our old life that we have altered for Him. God says, I'm calling you to live for me, and I'm giving you what it takes. Don't do it in your own power. You can't do it in your own power. In Ephesians 1.9, Paul prays that God would enlighten the eyes of his readers' hearts so that they would know what is the surpassing greatness of His power towards us who believe? Have you ever truly recognized the greatness of God's power in your life, that He's given you everything that you need? Have you looked back on something that maybe you went through or maybe something you were part of and you're like, I don't know where that came from. That was God's grace. Paul goes on to re- relate the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you and I. Think about that. The power of God that was used to raise Jesus from the dead is now a part of our life because he's raised us from the dead too. This means that it takes God for conversion. It takes his resurrection power. Now we're called to live in harmony with his moral character. God's excellence is is what he's called us to live to. It's right there in that part of scripture. So the instant we're Alive spiritually by His power, we receive the power of the Holy Spirit to produce godliness in us. And here's why. Because we now become partakers of His divine nature for the world's benefit. God did it for us. We live what He did for us for the world. Everything comes back to glorifying God. When God calls us to salvation, He imparts to us new life. Peter says it's by God's promises that you and I may become partakers of the divine nature. He's referring this not only to future possibility, but right now. Now that you're saved, as John Calvin says, he says that those in Christ, the image of God in holiness and righteousness is restored in us. When we are now in Christ, we now start looking like God. There was a time, and we don't get the amount of time that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, but they looked like him, not physically, but in their nature, they looked like him until sin came. And when we're back in Christ... Peter says we've, given, we've been given everything for life to be back with God through Christ to live in godliness. Now, the exact meaning of this statement is a little bit ambiguous, but as you track it down, here's what we can say confidently. Being created in the image of God, we're able to share, however imperfectly, some of God's attributes like love and holiness. When we receive the fullness of what He's given us, we now show who He is that gave us that fullness. Remember, part of the gift of eternal life includes the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I, I can't say this enough, and there's parts of Scripture that talk about, well, for one example, don't, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, don't inhibit, don't stifle the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And Peter says that we are partakers of His divine nature. He's not saying we become little gods. What he's saying is there's a little bit more of God showing in us every day. That when people look at a Christian who is living in the fullness of what God has provided, they see God, not in the physical, but in the action and the attributes. The character of God. What do you think the greatest character of God is? I'm going to say it's love. Everything that he has done has been for us because he loves us. When you are living in the fullness of what he has provided, other people see love that the world just can't give. Jesus said it squared up. 
when all the false prophets that were around just at that time, not even counting, I'm not taking a shot at anybody in Payson, but Payson has, I don't know, 614 now religious organizations. But Jesus said this, here's what people will know about you if you're my disciple because you love different. Because you love in a way that only God could have instilled in you to love. We can love because he first loved us. It all ties together. And when you and I are living in this provision that God has given for uh, us to live for him, people are going to see you and they're going to think, that person loves God. Not because you told them, but because you showed them. Not because you told them, look at me and what I'm doing, but because they saw you and what you're doing. Partaking in his divine nature makes all of this possible. Peter wants us to live. Go ahead, Jesse, next slide. I won't even, I won't even commit to when this is going to work to all of you. So thank you, Jesse, for staying in the booth today. Peter wants us to live in God's peace and in God's grace. I put that at the bottom of emails that I send out from the church, and here's why. There's no better place for me to be as in God's peace and God's grace. But as he says this, peace and grace, then he says, by living in the fullness that God has provided for you and I for life and godliness. And when we live in that, we have God's peace and God's grace. What a great reminder. Sometimes we're swayed into living outside of God's provision, and we're still crying out for his help. It's the story of the guy. He was in a flood and... and uh, a, a, a guy walks up pulling a boat because this guy's up on his deck and he's saying, hey, get in the boat, I'll pull you to safety. He's like, no, God will take care of me. If you've heard it, don't jump to the end. Let me tell the story. <laughs> the water goes up higher and now comes a motorboat. <laughs> right? Hey, let me come up next to your, to, to your roof there. And you can get in. No, God's going to save me. And then he's at the peak of his roof. He's standing there, one foot on each side. See, I'm changing the story a little bit. One foot on each side, each pitch so he can balance because the water's moving a little bit. And water's up to about here. And as a helicopter comes in, drops the ladder. Hey, you know, grab a hold, we'll save you. He's like, God's going to save me. Anyway, he dies, goes to heaven. He's all mad. God, why didn't you? And he says, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. Appreciate the laugh. We need to live in the provision, the full provision that God's given us. Not our own and then cry out to God, God, fix my mistake. He did already. The ultimate mistake was sin and he fixed it. Be happy with that. But what we can't do is expect God to get us out of the ruts that we dig and jump in ourselves. What Peter is saying is he's given you everything to live right eternally and for him here. Stay in that. John MacArthur, another quote, he says this, To seek something more than what we have been given in Christ is like frantically knocking on a door, seeking what's inside, not realizing you hold the key in your pocket. Great visual. If you're feeling defeated, defeated excuse me, by sin or burdened by life, either you do not understand that God is all efficient and you can tap into those resources, or maybe you don't have his life dwelling in you. Either way, there's an answer. Give your life to Christ. Live your life in Christ. His promises give you unlimited resources. Don't be like the chief. Don't wear God's resources around your neck and never cash in on them. Grow in your knowledge of Christ and his promises, and he will satisfy your soul. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are everything we need. Because you are everything. I can't even grasp the concept. God eternal. Loving me. And not just enough to get me back in a relationship with you. But so much that you want to be a part of my life now and forever.
I thank you for that grace. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. I know it looks like tragedy. I know that it was unjust. But I receive that it was on my behalf. God, today as we partake in what we call the Lord's Supper, we do it remembering that your full provision came because your son came. That he lived a life that we needed to live but we couldn't. That he died a death that we truly deserved but didn't receive. He rose again and has prepared a place for us. Thank you, God, for your son's body broken and his blood shed so that we can receive the fullness of your grace. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning, go ahead and uh, go ahead and take when you're ready, spend some time with the Lord. words it's hard not to 
smile when you're listening to those proclamations. God is sufficient in everything, and I'm going to tie that into this. I have made a decision in my, in, oh, I say it's me. Like, I'm in control of anything. I have people in my life that are part of God's provision that have a right to help me stay on track other than the time it takes to do a sermon. Nobody gets, nobody gets to speed me up. I don't know what I said. There's only two Johns scripturally, but at the point of revelation, one of them didn't have a head, and so he, it wasn't him, and maybe I accidentally said that. Did I say John the Baptist? My bad. Was this you? Um, John the Beloved. John the Beloved. Any of the Johns written and Revelation were John the Beloved. And I'm one of those people that corrects people because I have a problem. And if you say Revelations to me, I will tell you Revelation. I will correct you even though it was an accident. So um, thank you to my son who left me a little note that I need to clear this up. And I want to clear this up because I don't want anybody, I don't want to teach anything that's false. So it was John the Beloved, um, which I knew, but I, I said wrong. So thank you for that. Again, God is sufficient. He gives us what we need. He gives us people around us to help keep us on track or to remind us when we, when we slip. So here's the question. God's sufficiency, it has all been given to you. Amen? But has it all been received by you? It was a setup. It's up to you and I to realize this truth. Will we do it? Will we we receive everything God has given us for life and godliness? Adrian Rogers has a statement about responding to God. And here's what he says. He breaks it down into three different attitudes. He says, discipline says, I need to. Duty says, I ought to. Devotion says, I want to. Spend your life wanting to receive all that God has provided because the world's provision will never come close. I love you. Thanks for hanging out a little bit extra with me. And don't forget to talk to me afterwards. If you need the address, we're going to go help Joni load a truck. And if you didn't get a chance to say bye to her last week, oh, we have some visual effects. If you didn't get a chance to say bye to her last week, you can stop by and just do that. But go eat some lunch. She doesn't have food there. So come see me, get a dress, go eat some lunch and show up. If you eat a long lunch and go home and take a nap, I totally understand, but we will have missed you. You're dismissed. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Be safe. Love you.